Afus. You're ready to start, Christina. Yeah, we are delighted. Hello, everybody. Oh, Brian um, is here. Thank welcome you. back uh, to uh, our penultimate session uh, for the uh, BAF Global Summit. Uh, I have the pleasure of having with us uh, Claire Carrington, who's the Canadian Blockchain Consortium, uh, and Christina Conner, who is editor in chief at Coin Telegraph. Uh, so, Claire, if you would uh, like to start for us, that'd be great. I think we will have Christina first, Brian, because Claire had some problem with the video. So, Christina, I think you can go ahead. That's fine. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored and happy to be here today. Um, and uh, thank you very much, Brian, for the introduction. Uh, so um, I was asked to talk about the current state of um, the policy uh, making within the crypto space. Being an editor-in-chief of uh, one of the oldest and largest publications dedicated to blockchain and cryptocurrencies, we are definitely um, feeling very proud and responsible about covering the policy space as well. Uh, we consider it one of the most important part of this development. Uh, and uh, even though crypto assets are still new and revolutionary, uh, the policy frame is definitely something that represents traditional approach to any industry. And it's very, very important uh, to bring forward policy making. It's also no surprise that regulations for cryptocurrencies are also in their infancy. So it's even more important to talk about it. And thank you again for organizing this wonderful event to bring these topics. So a quick look to, at the origins of crypto will help us see the regulatory scene in perspective. Blockchain technology is the backbone of all crypto assets. Until 2008, it was a relatively obscure concept that some computer scientists and cryptographers kicked around. That's the year when the famous Satoshi Nakamoto published the Bitcoin white paper. The timing is everything here. Uh, let's remind you that 2008 was in the middle of a financial crisis. That year, Lehman Brothers collapsed and the world was in upheaval because of the US subprime mortgages. It was a crisis of poor decisions and lack of regulatory oversight. Crypto was a reaction to all of that. Cryptocurrency offered a new financial model with a new approach to trust and transparency and no regulation. Where would it have come from? Regulation is reactionary by nature. There has to be something to regulate first and then the regulators act. Crypto had early adopters, of course, but there were not only uh, not only that many people in it. Uh, in the beginning, actually, it wasn't at all many people in it. One of the foundational stories of crypto, and maybe it's only a story of the type, is about Jeremy Stadivant, a teenager who earned 10,000 bitcoins for delivering some guys' pizzas. That happened in 2010. That is where it all came from, a small group of people who had a different vision of finance. That vision didn't have a large space for regulation. So you can imagine that regulators may have been somewhat unprepared when the crypto market reached $1 billion three years later, and all of a sudden crypto was the new Wild West. Unfortunately, the Wild West days are that many people still associate with crypto. Okay, there may be a few traces of those freewheeling times left, and there was some really memorably wild moments here. But... There was what got the regulatory process going, and it hasn't been easy. There are fundamental issues that have still not been settled. Can crypto assets fit into existing definitions and regulations? If so, which ones? How much regulation does crypto need? Who's even going to make those decisions? These are high stakes questions. To cloud the picture further, crypto is becoming more complex all the time. We have gone from Bitcoin alone to thousands of cryptocurrencies, plus non-fungible tokens, decentralized finance on decentralized autonomous organizations, central bank digital currencies, complex investment products, and you can be sure there is more to come. Around the world, we can see a wide range of solutions to these regulatory challenges. 
Several countries, predominantly Muslim, have placed absolute bans on crypto assets, although Dubai is at the same time a center of the crypto industry. China gave them a chance, but then banned cryptocurrency trading. China's central bank digital currency is at quite an advanced stage of development. The value of CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, are issued by central banks and tied to national fiat currency. These digital assets, but they are not crypto assets. In many countries, crypto has an ambiguous status. In Ethiopia, for example, the central bank banned crypto in June this year, apparently after ignoring it for years. And then it announced a regulatory program less than three months later. Crypto is legal in Indonesia, and the government itself is planning to invest in a new crypto asset exchange next year. Crypto is legal in the United States and European Union, but regulation is in an elementary state. The UK has proposed making crypto assets a form of property and an investment like any other. El Salvador has famously adopted Bitcoin as its national currency last year. The state of crypto asset regulation is not good or bad, rather it is history in the making. It reflects the state of crypto and the culture and aspirations of nations. The regulatory decisions that are slowly being made will shape the future. Regulation is unavoidable and desirable. We want to preserve crypto's free thing, independent, even rebellious heritage, I would say, but we also want a safe, predictable market that encourages and protects users. That is the only way crypto and its users will flourish. What we need for good regulation is education. We need to teach regulators and legislators what they are dealing with, because a lot of them clearly do not know. Everybody needs to know what crypto assets can do for them. Crypto means different things to different people. And the countries with limited infrastructure need crypto every bit as much as so-called crypto bros. We, the industry, the community, we need to teach people how to use crypto safely to avoid the embarrassing situations they call rock poles. And we need to buckle up for much more regulation to come. Blockchain technology will be adopted in more and more situations because the technology has so much offered to offer to humanity and that will inevitably lead to a lot more regulation. Representing the community, I really would love to, to say that this community is really full of great ideas, great energy and ambitions to change the world. And the only way to move forward is to create a dialogue among all the actors. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to more and more transparent, clear and educating regulatory frames for the crypto and blockchain industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, great to hear from Cointelegraph, as always. Um, I think now I'm hoping we have uh, we have our next speaker, uh, Claire Carrington, uh, from the Canadian Blockchain Consortium. Claire, is that you there? Yes, here. Great, great, lovely to see you. Um, over to you. Wonderful. Um, is it possible to uh, share my screen for some presentations? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. Sorry, just give me a quick second and I will be... Are you able to see it? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, it's great. Um, it's great to be with you here today. My name is Clay Carrington. I am the executive director for the Canadian Blockchain Consortium. And sorry, I'm going to give you basically our consortium's perspective on Canada's crypto asset regulations. So this is going to include uh, major developments, lessons we've learned from global moves in the space, and what we believe Canada needs to do to accelerate this crypto innovation, but while protecting consumers from the kind of serious issues that we have definitely seen impacting the market from exchanges and stable coins.
As Canada's largest national advocacy organization for the blockchain industry, we've definitely spent a lot of time engaging with our governments through industry forums, policy roundtables, through our expert finance and legal committees. We conduct research, we create policy recommendations for our sector. So I believe that we're at a rather critical inflection point for the regulation of crypto assets in Canada. And this could be a key competitive advantage for our company global, for our country globally, sorry. So first of all, uh, it's now possible for, um, it's impossible for governments to ignore the tremendous scale and impact of crypto assets. While the overall market cap of cryptocurrency has declined significantly from its peak about $3 trillion in 2021, adoption by both consumers and corporations is moving quite quickly. With this level of adoption also comes risk, uh, especially for a growing number of financial products, including ETFs, trading on the TSX that total billions in assets under management. So it's a delicate balance for regulators who need to protect consumers from the kind of catastrophic collapses that we've seen experienced by stable coins such as Terra Luna, as well as lending platforms like Celsius, which have cost users billions in losses or frozen funds. So without restricting innovation, we need to stay competitive on the global economy as we become more digital. So Canadian regulators have the benefit of learning lessons hard won by other jurisdictions around the world. In the United States in 2021, they introduced their infrastructure bill, which contained, contained some misguided rules on crypto asset regulation, including definitions that would have required even blockchain developers to register as investment brokers. So a big lesson here was that governments really needed to engage fully with the industry to gain the knowledge they needed to regulate it appropriately. So I believe Canada is starting to do a really good job with that. We also have examples in Europe, which responded quickly to 2021's rise in consumer adoption and risk to create clear EU-wide regulations and protect consumers. And APAC, where countries were once a free-for-all, um, have gone a bit too far in other directions with prohibitions, harsh restrictions, um, and completely crushed the digital um, innovation, most notably in there would have been China. So crushing our emerging digital economy is also a risk in Canada. In response to some of the big systematic failures, uh, the global industry like Celsius's lending platform and exchange collapse, the Canadian securities administrators have issued new interim guidance as of mid-August this year that will divide crypto assets into high and moderate risk categories. It'll limit exposure and require new reporting by banks and regulated financial institutions and result in increased security for companies that provide a perceived high risk secure activities. The new interim rules built on regulations by the CSA from March and June of 2021 that require exchanges to either, either register uh, as investment dealers or seek exemptive relief to register as money service businesses. We're the only jurisdiction in the world to regard any exchange trading where the asset isn't instantly delivered to the purchaser as a crypto contract. That qualifies as a derivative security, which puts us in a relatively strict category when it comes to security status of exchange traded crypto assets. A key way we can still support innovation, even within these strict regulatory frameworks, is through the use of regulatory sandboxes. So they permit crypto assets to provide, um, or sorry, service providers and product developers to build their businesses and offerings in a monitored environment prior to gaining full regulatory approvals. With the fast paced nature of the crypto industry and lengthy process for approvals, this is rather essential, essential for a competitive advantage. Alberta Sandbox has been um, rather successful. Many companies have applied, but they have multiple streams to the sandbox where um, multiple uh, custodians have actually been approved through that. So innovation creating policies like regulatory sandboxes, they take a lot of political will. For that, leaders need to understand the relevance and importance of the industry and to be empowered through this education to support fair and clear regulations. In Alberta, we presented our UCP leadership with numerous policy and white papers and engaged with them in discussions with our industry, leading to politics that have helped our growth and business development. On a federal level, a landmark bill 
Bill for Crypto Asset Regulation was introduced by a member of Parliament, Michelle Rempel, earlier this year. And the new leader of the Conservative Party has also been rather vocal supporter of the industry. Um, another major success Canada has had through its crypto asset regulation is the integration of our industry with traditional markets, especially through ETFs. In February 2021, after very lengthy regulatory education and collaboration, the TSX lifted the world's first ETF backed by physically settling Bitcoin, creating opportunities for investment by regulated industries corporations, and a wider pool of investors. We've now expanded to multiple Bitcoin, Ethereum, and combined ETFs and remain a global leader in exchange trading products um, for this innovation. So moving forward, I am confident that we can build on our success and create a rather strong digital economy that protects consumers from fraud as well as systematic failures. But to get there, we definitely need some critical elements from regulators. Firstly, our rather conservative banking institutions are, well, I'll say it lightly, reluctant to provide services to crypto asset sector. So they restrict the growth and innovation through um, disallowing access to banking. We can see from the crypto hubs like Texas, where banks are permitted to take crypto and deposit by the state government, that leadership by regulators in banking and the industry can dramatically accelerate its progress and its economic impact. Secondly, we need full clarity on the status of digital assets, including NFTs, stablecoins, asset-backed tokens. Guidelines have been issued by the CSA that these are digital representations. Their underlying assets uh, have the same security status, but this, this needs to be more formalized for both digital innovation and to protect consumers. Thirdly, uh, services like insurance and custodianship are essential for consumer safety, but there is very little regulatory support for the growth of these businesses. So we need a policy task force that will help expand services provisions for custodians who can protect exchange assets from failures and fraud and insurers who will help to manage and mitigate the risk to these consumer assets. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. I'd really love to hear from you on your questions or ideas about crypto asset regulation in Canada. Uh, our consortium, we publish monthly magazine along with reports, white papers, and we hold frequent in-person and online events like our Canadian Blockchain Summit coming up in October. We also provide educational webinars and courses through Blockchain for Financial Services in collaboration with our Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. So I really encourage you to visit us at candablockchain.ca uh, to learn more about what we're doing. Kalea, thank you very much. That's much appreciated. Great to hear uh, what's happening in Canada. Uh, sounds like a reasonably tricky situation, but one that can certainly move quite fast as, as the industry does. So thank you very much again. Uh, I think we're going to close the session there. Um, our final session will be in about a quarter of an hour, uh, and that is with the Honourable Caroline Pham, who is a commissioner at the United States Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And that's uh, our keynote address and the, the end of the summit. Uh, so, um, uh, Kalea, thank you very much. And Christina, thank you very much as well. Uh, hopefully see you uh, in about a quarter of an hour. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much.